Today on the Transplant Helper, I want to share with you a detailed update as far as my health, how things are going, and even more than that, I promise you, promise you, promise you, this is going to be an inspiring, a touching, an unbelievable story the way it works out. And oh, how great it has been to be a part of this journey. It's not always easy, but for me personally, what happened on yesterday that I'm about to share blew my mind. I'm so excited about it. I hope that you'll enjoy it as we go through. Stay tuned, my friend. Hit the subscribe button and click the bell notification to become part of the Transplant Helper community. Hey, Transplant Helper community. My name is Jim Murrow. I just want to pause for just a moment and give you a humongous update, a detailed update as far as my health goes. Now, most of you have already seen my update from yesterday where I gave kind of a short, quick, and in a hurry update, even in a parking deck, where I basically said that I am going to have an aortic valve replacement. However, the great news is they are going to be able to do that as a transcatheter replacement. So that's much better than being opened up. And even though it's not as common as some of the others, they finally are confirming, I think finally today, that they are going to be able to do the procedure itself. And, and so hopefully they'll give me a call and tell me that's the case. If so, hopefully I can schedule that for June the 17th. That's kind of the day I've got picked out. They would have done it as early as next week, but I got some things to tie up. But anyway, I thought it would be fun if we just sat down and went back through and I had one of those uh, kind of reaction type videos because to be totally honest with you, I actually recorded most of the entire doctor visit yesterday. So I'm going to share those details with you in that way. I'll pause it from time to time, give you my reaction, uh, try to explain some things so that we can learn together and hopefully you'll benefit from this even aside from checking up on me. And so before we jump into that, though, let me say again, thank you, thank you, thank you to each and every one of you who paused and prayed for me on yesterday, who sent thoughtful messages. I've got tons and tons of messages, uh, comments below the videos, emails. I started getting texts. Uh, I had forgotten I'd give my personal number out, but I don't mind that. <laughs> I started getting personal texts from people. It was absolutely great. My friend Martin Barber gave me a call the other night, talked to me at length. Just really, really good folks. So thank you to each and every one of you. You've been a huge support to me. I know you'll continue to do that. I'm not quite over this hump, but hopefully this will be a game changer for me before very long. Anyway, let's jump into this reaction video. I'm just going to play the audio from yesterday's visit, uh, stop it a few times and, and you know, talk about it. By the way, I'll say this too before we jump in that uh, I wasn't on my intelligent game yesterday. Uh, really tired, really, you know, fatigued and also probably didn't do my best as far as interviewing them. Thankfully, they're great doctors, and so they really took care of me. Now, the first clip you're going to hear right here, uh, they're all coming in the room. Basically, Dr. Davies, which you see right here on the screen, and Dr. Sasser are going to be walking in the room. They're the two of the top guys as far as these procedures go. Uh, their nurse practitioner, an old friend of mine, Abby, also was there. So thankful to see each and every one of them, and you'll understand more about that in a moment. Let's get the video. Hey, how are you? Good, Dr. Davies. This is you. Nice. Mark, nice to meet you. Let's see. Talk to me about you last week when we got you in. He was worried about you. He was worried, and he got me a little bit worried. So. Your, your, your transplant was in 2013, is that right? Yes, sir. And have you noticed you've been feeling a little short of breath? Or? Um, mainly my shoulder tortness and breath uh, revolves around staircases or inclines. For some reason, I can hit these stairs better than I can hit the slightest incline. That's pretty that common, sense. unfortunately, I think. With all, is, it, is it worse now than it was a year ago? I would probably say yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me pause it right there. Uh, Dr. Sasser, when he came in, he mentioned Jose. That's Jose Talaj, my main transplant cardiologist. Uh, Dr. Talaj was very concerned about me the other day after the cath, even more so than I thought. You know, I knew that he was going to be contacting these guys, trying to get some idea about what to do. But as it turns out, Dr. Talaj actually went and personally found Dr. Sasser, uh, caught him in the hall, had a sit down with him about me. And apparently, I discovered by the end of this, they've already had a few sit downs talking about my case. So, yeah, if it scares Dr. Talaj, it scares me. Now, I'm not shaking in my boot fear or scary, but yeah, it, it shook me up, I have to admit. And uh, Dr. Talaj being afraid was part of that. I've been dealing with, with that a little bit. I've been having dizzy spells for almost two years that part of which we track back to my eyesight because I know I've got, a, I call it the crooked eye. And I, you know, I wear 
prisms mm-hmm. for that because I'd had cross-eyed spells. But every time I would talk to the uh, to the eye doctors and the, the neuros doctors about it, they would say, all right, hold on right there. This is definitely proof that I wasn't on my game yesterday. Um, I told him every time I talked to the eye doctors, which, uh, you know, he understands that. Typically, I would say the ophthalmologist. And then I mentioned the neuros. Uh, yeah, like that's a thing. Now, I understand we call neurologists neurosurgeons, you know, that sort of thing. But I call them neuros. Actually, I go to a neurologist as well as a neuro-ophthalmologist, so kind of a combo doc there, a really specialized doc. That's who's been treating me for these cross-eyed spells, dizzy spells. I've talked about that on a program before, but I've kind of felt a little, little, little. Uh, I'll just say it, a little stupid after I said that to him, but he, he smiled a little bit, and um, yeah, he gave me credit for what I was trying to say. Well, we understand the, the double vision, but we don't understand why you're so lightheaded, dizzy yeah. with it. I don't know if it's it doesn't seem to be related now all of a sudden. Now I'm thinking, okay, it wasn't related. It just happened to be. Um, over the last, really since my cath, and I know there's some things that go on when they have to go through. When's the last this, cath you had? My long? cath was last Tuesday, so a week ago. I've been especially more lightheaded, shorter breath from time to time. Which, okay. you know. Now that right there was another one of those moments where I almost backpedaled, and let me say this, you need to always, always, always tell your physicians, tell your teams, tell the doctors, whoever's talking to you, interviewing you like this, you need to always be completely honest with them. But I almost backpedaled, actually, and didn't tell him about the most recent shortness of breath uh, that I mentioned there as being since my cath, because I realized that I'm sitting here talking to a doctor, telling him that all of a sudden my symptoms have gotten worse, I've gotten more short of breath, more lightheaded, more dizzy. And it just so happens to coincide with the day I got my cath, which was only last week, so a week ago yesterday. And in my mind, I'm a I'm I'm a person who thinks ahead, and my wife picks at me about that. She said, "You're never thinking about the moment; you're thinking about what's coming up in five minutes or an hour." And I do that, but in thinking ahead, I was I was also thinking to myself, you know what? If I tell this doctor that these terrible symptoms started last Tuesday, he's going to look at me and say, yeah, I've seen your type before. We told you your aortic valve was bad, and all of a sudden you're symptomatic. Well, uh, that wasn't really the way it was. I have not felt good since my cath, but part of that comes in in that while they did the cath, they had to break through the aortic arch, come around and break through that stenosed, if that's the word, but that aortic valve that has stenosis, they had to crack through that to get the pressures on the bottom side of my heart. So, you know, while they were doing that, I'm sure that kind of knocked some things off kilter. So I felt a little bit rough, uh, had some better days uh, before at least, but I was kind of hesitant to tell him that. But don't be afraid because he needs to know. The doctors need to know that information. Um, you know. Did they do a biopsy at that time as well? Did not do a biopsy okay. that day. I passed biopsies from okay. So That's encouraging, folks. There is a point post-transplant if you're not uh, experiencing rejection or at least many episodes of rejection. I've had none. Uh, but that where you can stop doing biopsies, and that's great. Now, it doesn't keep you out of the cath lab sometimes because you need your pressures checked. For me, I had to have my valve checked on a regular basis, so obviously I was in there for that at least annually. But the biopsies to the neck, that sort of thing, done and over, thankfully. <laughs> so there's there's an encouragement to you. The um, you know, the valve we were looking at, your valve, you know, the, the transplant that they used for you had a bicuspid valve. It had an abnormal valve. Uh, which is not always common because that valve can fail a little bit sooner than a regular trileaflet valve. And looking at your valve, it's gotten pretty calcified, and it looks like it's failed, whether it's not opening quite right and it's not closing quite right. All right, now that right there, that's kind of the biggest point of this story. And I, I think I mentioned it the other day in my kind of a Houston We Have a Problem video, my, my six-year transplant anniversary update. Um, my donor, Nikki, his heart came with this bicuspid, uh, somewhat calcified valve. And he's going to talk more about that in a few minutes. But basically, the bicuspid means these valves, the aortic valve, is supposed to be a tricuspid, a three 
uh, leaflet valve. And so there should be three leaflets that work together, and then I can't really do it, more like in a triangle, and open and close, and they're able to accept blood and, and that sort of thing, or eject blood, and then close to keep the blood from back flowing in. I have a bicuspid valve. My donor had a bicuspid valve. So, of course, that's what I inherited. The bicuspid valve uh, is really more, you know, in the neighborhood of, of something with with two leaflets. And, of course, I can't, well, maybe I can do it that way with my fingers. With only the two leaflets right here, the closing and opening of it works more like that. And it's just not as good of a seal. And so if you have a bicuspid valve, and there are a handful of people who are born that way, if you have a bicuspid valve, it's not going to function as well as the original uh, tricuspid valve should have been. Sometimes people are born with that as a defect. Other times, a tricuspid becomes a bicuspid because one of the leaflets gets hung. But in my case, bicuspid valve from birth, I inherited that. So they've always known, at least for the last six years, they've known this could be an issue. So he's basically talking about that. Either one is not totally, frankly, severe, but the combination of the two is probably causing this to be severe and have a severe valve problem. There's no, there's no way to fix this structural problem without some type of surgery. And then we were looking at it to do open heart surgery for you. It can be done, but it's open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. All right, now a few people asked me the other day after my update, Jim, can't they just repair the valve? You've heard about people having their valves repaired. And yeah, that does happen. The most common way of repairing a valve, however, is really just in a cantilever through a balloon procedure where they go in and they knock away some of the calcification, some of the plaque, and they're able to kind of break things loose and then hopefully get it to work a little bit better. However, in my case, the stenosis was past that, as well as the fact that's not the safest way to go about things. As they develop these newer valves, these replacement valves, whether it be the tissue type or the mechanical type, they're just better options. They're just better off to just fix it. As, Don, as Barney Fife would say, just to nip it in the bud, get it over with, uh, because going in there and breaking that stuff up, that's going to release some of the calcification, and it could, of course, go and cause really problems, more problems with blockage. So they're, they're talking now about whether or not to do it in an open heart procedure, which I really didn't want. I was dreading that or the transcatheter method. And of course, I've already told you the result, but here it is. We try to avoid that if we could. We think we can probably go through your groin possibly. We'd have to get a CAT scan. As long as the CAT scan looked okay, go through your groin to put this special type of valve in to help the valve work better. Uh, transcatheter valve. Okay. Um, if the CT scan looks good, which I think it will be, what caused your heart failure to start with in 2000? All right, you already know the answer to this. My heart failure was caused by being a transposition patient at birth, transposition of the great arteries or great vessels, depending on who you ask, and uh, just living through that. So that caused my original heart failure. That's going to play into the decision he makes, too. Uh, well, I go back to congenital. I was congenital transposition. Okay. And I had a muscular procedure in 75. Uh -huh. Did well yep. until I was 32. And Youngest baby in 1975 to be opened up in Alabama. Just a little fact. Rhythm problems, everything kind of followed the path they expected, other than I was a lot older than they expected. Right. You know, they didn't think I'd make it that long. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where it goes back. But you felt much, after you recovered from the heart transplant, you felt better and got better than until just recently? I did, and I've never been 100%, you know, okay. um, done very well. You know, none of the typical rejection. I've not experienced any of that. It's just I've never really been perfect. But I have a congenital life to reflect on, so anything for me is great. Yeah. Relative. Correct, correct. You're not running marathons, but you probably no. never expected you never to be never wanted to. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Mark Barber. I am so excited for you, the success you've had as far as cycling, you know, running, uh, swimming, triathlon type stuff, and I hope that you get back to that. By the way, Mark, I'm certainly praying for you every day. I hope that you get your strength back, you get things kind of leveled out, you get back to what you want to do. But I personally, <laughs> I'm not an athlete, never have been, uh, not interested in it. I want to be healthy, I want to live. Uh, I like living my life through people like you, Mark, and, and several others of you who've had great success. But I haven't had really great success since transplant. As far as rejection goes, as far as, you know, do I feel better? You know, am I, am I safer? Absolutely. But I think because this valve has always been a, a bicuspid and always been a little problematic and calcified that was getting worse, 
I think that's what's held me back a little bit. I, you know, just some of those little things that some of you, I'm so excited to have been able to accomplish or do, uh, you know, getting in the gym and going for those runs and, and, you know, just having that full life, I hadn't gotten there yet. So I'm praying that this procedure might get me there. Let's see what we got next. So I think that if we can get the CAT scan, they're going to try to get you scheduled down there today. And if the CAT scan shows we can go through the groin, then I think we can do the procedure. The procedure can be done. Uh, it takes about an hour. And if everything goes well, you spend one night in the ICU and four or five days. In, I mean, excuse me, a couple of days in the hospital total. Okay. Okay. couple things about that. He said, I think we can get you scheduled for the CT, the CAT scan today. When I actually talked to his nurse... Um, she came and told me, she said, we're not going to be able to get you in for CAT scan today. It's just not going to happen. Not here at UAB. Um, she was telling me about one of UAB's satellite offices, which does CAT scans and trying to convince me to, to go there. And I'd probably get in to be seen sooner and probably wouldn't have to wait so long for an appointment. Um, I, I just kindly told her, I said, look, Heather, um, if my transplant team was asking for this CT today, I'd be getting a CT today immediately, every time. I've done it over and over. Um, I don't know if they don't understand quite as much the uh, transplant process. Well, they know transplant process, don't get me wrong, but they don't necessarily understand the power, the authority, the pull <laughs> that we have to, to get priority in, in these transplant cases. And uh, so I, I knew in the back of my mind, if they, pull, if they ask for a CT, we'd get a CT. I'm going to get a CT that day. Okay. The risk is probably less than 5% of any major complications, except for there's a risk of a pacemaker that's a little bit more. But everything else, death, heart attack, stroke, infection, all a very small amount. Okay. Let's skip the pacemaker if we can, okay? How about that, Dr. Davies? I'm not that interested in uh, having that additional little, little surgery. Or any of you like I am, comment below the video if you had a, a defibrillator, pacemaker, whatever. Was that not worse, <laughs> pain-wise, some of for some of us than the transplant stuff? I know mine was because when they put in my defibrillator, um, can you see the scar? Where I don't know, but anyway, when they put it in, I'm glad I forgot about it. Uh, but when they put it in, they actually made a pocket in the muscle and inserted it to kind of hide it, so it wouldn't like the old pocket packet of cigarettes your granddaddy had when he got his the pacemaker. Oh, that hurt. And so, Dr. Davies, I'm not much on board with that, but, you know, we do what we have to do. Okay. And there's, um, there's nothing I can do to... To make this get better? off. Um, I mean, I know I can't make it better. But. Well, I mean, I mean, it's up to you. I mean, you're not just frankly severe, but we think that the symptoms you're having are related to this, and we think if we don't do something, you're going to have more symptoms. Right. Okay, that question actually went bad. I said, is there nothing I can do to put this off? Uh, my intention on the question was actually to ask him, you know, what can a person do to prevent having stenosis? Uh, what types of changes or lifestyle changes need to be done, say, as far as diet, exercise, you know, whatever that can help you later on or me later on even from having to go through this again the question went bad, one, because he didn't know what I was asking, but mainly because I didn't know how to ask it. And so he turns, gives me an answer of uh, basically, I could not have prevented this, you know, what's too late, and I can't, I can put it off. He was thinking more like I wanted to wait six years to get this done instead of getting it done next week. That wasn't it either, but total misunderstanding of the question. So I don't have your information on his ideas about what you can do to prevent this. But I do know in my case, being that it came from the donor heart this way, not a lot I could do to change that. So Dickie and I, Dickie, we work together, man. I, I still love you. And we work together and we'll go through this together as well. well I don't want to end up back in heart failure because mm -hmm. this, you know, understand if it's not flowing, it's eventually going to cause some distress on the bottom side. So the pump just can't pump against that obstruction. It's just like any basic water pump you put into a system. If you pump against an obstructed pipe over and over, it's going to wear out pretty quick. Right. Now, I may illustrate this in a later video um, as far as what's happening when the aortic stenosis occurs and when it, you know, calcification gets in there and stops this valve off. The heart there at the bottom is pumping against it extremely hard and having to work harder and harder to push the blood through. Um, as it does that, it can cause damage to the, to the bottom of the heart. I call it a sac. I think it's a sac, but it can, it can begin to stretch out and cause damage. If you've ever seen a cheap water hose, now I've got a good one now that won't do it. I actually tested, but an old cheap water hose like we had when we was a kid, if you take and kink the water hose, 
it'll stop the water. The water will stop flowing. However, as it does that, if you can watch it, the hose begins to bubble behind it. The water backs up, the hose gets bigger and bigger, and I've actually seen hoses burst because the pressure got so high behind it, and that's the risk of this aortic stenosis if it's a complete shutoff, or for that case, any blockage in your heart. Not only does it cause damage because the oxygenated blood is not getting through, it causes damage as well to the pump itself because it's pumping against something it can't overcome. And Jose was telling me because the, the transplant may or may not last a long time, and he wants to make sure that he preserve, he doesn't do a second operation. He, did he tell you about that? That that's why we would do the valve this right. time. All right, now that's a discussion I understood and I knew it was coming, but I didn't want to really consider. Uh, Dr. Sasser is telling me that Jose, Dr. Talage, knows that my transplant may or may not last a long time. Now, what they're basically saying is there, again, we all as transplant patients live on a razor's edge between what's, what's going good and what will or could potentially go wrong, okay? And uh, so transplant is a treatment not a cure. I know some people don't like to hear that, but that's honest. Transplant is not a treatment, but a cure. You're trading out one set of problems for another. Now, granted, your life is saved. Granted, you may feel great. Granted, there's going to be so many benefits to such, but transplant's not a treatment, not a cure. And so they're understanding that the average lifespan post-transplant right now is bumping somewhere between five and 10 years. I, I like to talk about it as more of the 10 year mark. Of course, there are a lot of you who have done more than that. Congratulations to that. I know Sam Fitz is one of those, a great friend over on Facebook, his wife Iris. He's well over the 30 year mark, doing great. There are others who are knocking on the door of 30 years, plenty in the 18, 20 year range. But again, the average for single organ transplant, I mean by that not having to have three hearts to make it 20 years, but only to have one, is still around that top tier 10 year mark. It's getting better. Technology is improving, but Dr. Sasser is beginning to mention, and he'll, he'll talk about it more in a moment, the actual reality that I could have to go through a second transplant, which I'm not a real fan of here. So, uh, you know, this is probably the hardest pill I swallowed all day yesterday. It's just hearing the word transplant associated with my name again. It's like in a way my PTSD kicked in and I just went in a zone then where I was like, I just had to block this. I can't I can't talk about this. I did talk a little bit. You know me, I'm going to talk, but uh, here we go. I mean, and this may not last a long time, but we can do it a valve within a valve potentially, and then it, when it does decay, we have other, other um, uh, it'll probably have better technology by then. Right. So it is not a perfect solution, but it's the best solution for you. So just in case they had to do a second transplant in the future, we don't keep opening you up. Okay. Well, All right, I like that. Did you hear what he said? This is what sets, and, and you have great doctors. I'm sure you have great doctors, but this is what sets my doctors apart from everybody else I'm, uh, that I would think about in the world. Dr. Sasser just said, this may not be the best option or treatment, but it's the best one for you, okay? He said, this is the best one for me. Individualized care. That's what they offer at UAB. That's what Dr. Sasser's offering. He's offering a care plan that works for me. So ultimately, what they're going to tell me later is they're going to be putting in a tissue valve. And they understand that the tissue valve will not last as long as maybe a mechanical valve. However, they're trying to buy time. They're trying to keep me from being opened up again. I had surgery at six months old. I had transplant at 38. They're trying to keep from cracking my chest again to do a valve replacement. So they're going to take the easy road with the easier to install valve to avoid cracking my chest, to save my chest for whatever might come. And that could be as much as another transplant. So they want to leave, you know, leave things as intact as they possibly can. I think Dr. Davies is going to chime in and, and help with that explanation. I was blessed with my transplant because um, going into it, everybody's expectation was there's going to be a lot of scar tissue, going to be this, going to be that. And um, then they got in there and it was a lot better than expected. That's so right. the transplant went smoothly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I know that won't always be the case because yeah. I've been through it again. Yes. I don't need to go through it again, you know. Right. So you already had two sternotomies because you had one as a kid, right? Right. You only had one as a kid for the mustard, or did you have more than one? Um, just one. Just well, one. Yeah. Dumb answer right there. 
The word stranotomy means to crack the chest, okay? It's to take the sternum and separate it. And when he said stranotomy, actually, I kind of just went blank. And instead of saying, what you talking about, doctor? I, I tried to act like I knew what I was talking about. And I started to describe, as you're about to hear, how that I went in for surgery at six months. Uh, there was some bleeding. They had to take me back in the next day as if that was another sternotomy. It's not because the, the sternum is not healed and been broken again. So dumb answer. Uh, it, lesson learned. If you're not exactly sure what the doctor's talking about, don't play like you know because you don't know. I figured it out later in the conversation. It was another one of those moments where I was like, oh, no. what did I just say? <laughs> they do a shunt first. Hey, no, put in, they did the most the procedure, then took me out and took me back the next day because of some bleeding. But right. Never yeah, but, really been but just one healed time. Healed and broke. So. So, so we're already talking about if they get to the point where if you were to need another transplant or something like that, then that's why they you would already be at the third time sternotomy. They prefer for us not to do the third now. Then you have to have the fourth then. Right, right. Yeah. So um, let's get you down because they were trying to get in a hurry. I'm going to get um, um, Heather to come in here so she can get you to get the CT scan done. Okay. Okay? Sounds good. What are you expecting after the CT time-wise? Um, then we'll talk about you this week and go over everything this week, and I think we could probably do it next week, don't you think? Okay. Without yeah. one. Did you see? Did you hear how quiet I was when I said, "Okay, yeah." When he told me that he would talk about me, they have big meetings over there. When they talk about me this week, probably get me in next week. I was taken back because even though I've been trying to process this and get ready for this, at the same time, like many of you, just the fact that it's actually going to happen and going to happen so quickly has shocked me. Uh, he's going to give me some options later as far as scheduling, more at my own leisure, more at my own convenience. But yeah, this if you've ever been hit in the face with news, I've been hit in the face with several pieces of news today, good and bad. And uh, it kind of, uh, I kind of sunk in my seat for a minute when he told me he could do it next week. But anyhow. There's no, there's no I rush. Work. I mean, because it's, it's mainly leaky. It's not as stenotic. It's not as blocked as much as it's leaky. But I mean, we like to get people within the two weeks, so you don't have to like put everything on hold to get okay. it done. Sounds great. Okay. Hold on one second. Let me get Heather. Okay. Don't want you leaving before she gets upset with. You. All right. Now this is my favorite part. I told you already. I think on yesterday's video, there would definitely be some wow moments where I'm honestly, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you what I see. I see the providence and the act of God in my story right here. It, it started really when originally when Abby right here, when Abby came in the room with them, I knew Abby. Abby was one of my CIC nurses, CICU nurses. She was a nurse practitioner for me on the floor. I'd been around Abby already. She knew my case and, and I knew her. So immediately I'm feeling familiar ground. Um, I, I recognize these two fellas, but I'm over on the transplant floors all the time. So Dr. Sasser, as well as Dr. Davies, I'm familiar with them. Um, I already, you know, know I know of them and have had conversations with them even before, but I'm not sure why he's about, Dr. Davies is about to stick his head in a room and tell me something that I didn't know, or at least didn't remember that while wow, again, God is with me. This is it right here though. Listen. I guess you know what's funny. I did your donor. You did. I went and got your donor heart. I'm pretty wow. sure because I remember going to. I don't know 100 percent sure, but I remember going to get a donor one time and calling David McGiffin because did McGiffin uh -huh. do your and, and calling McGiffin and saying, "Look, there's a bicuspid valve here that you can see on the echo." And then I remember having to take the heart out and really examine the valve and call him back and say the valve actually looks pretty good. And then making they made it. I didn't make it. McGiffin made the decision right. to, to use it, but I remember going to get. Yeah. I think and it was yours. Uh, he that's amazing, it's folks. Uh, six years ago, last week, this man, Dr. Davies, basically was the, uh, he was the one who went and, and procured, they say it, went and, went and picked up the heart. And he went to Oklahoma to get it, and he recognized me. I'd been recognizing him. He knew more than I did as we were going on in our conversation, apparently, but he's now telling me that he's the one that went and picked up my heart. So this man right here is every bit as much of a lifesaver, an angel to me, as Dr. Ben Giffen, who did the surgery, as my whole team who had been involved in this. And so here's another place where... 
I didn't realize it, but I'm so, so blessed because I'm six years post now. And lo and behold, who is the doctor that's about to help me? Who is the doctor that's about to do this procedure and potentially save my life again? Right there, Dr. Davies. And so I'm just, wow. I, I tell you what, I was thrilled to hear that. It just proves to me again that, you know, God's got my back. I, I am absolutely covered um, you know, I don't deserve perfect health. I don't expect perfect health. And I wouldn't be mad if I didn't have it because I hadn't had it. But definitely people are working in my lives. And so we've got Dr. Sasser, who's been talking to Dr. Delodge, sitting down personal, already in my case, Dr. Davies, who actually procured my heart. And then Abby, who cared for me in the transplant procedure. And uh, by the way, Heather, he mentioned his nurse, Heather. Heather was actually... I don't know if you call it the head or charge or whatever, but she was the main nurse during my transplant. She stood beside Dr. McGiffin and worked with him during transplant. So all of the people I met today were directly involved with my heart transplant. And it's just so amazing to come full circle and to be back here again with them and to have myself, to have the confidence in knowing that, they're going to be able to do this. These are the best of the best. And these are people who have been there with me before. So another real reason why I love you, AB, and I'll never leave you, AB. I'm convinced. I'm not leaving because when you build a team, you build a relationship, you build friendships like this, you have an advantage. I just have an advantage over someone whose team has turnover or maybe you had to move from one center to another, or whatever. I've just got advantages, and I'm so thankful for that. He's taking a lot of flack. He doesn't know it because he's gone. Yeah. But he's taking a lot of flack since because everybody says, of course, most of this is fellows and stuff. Right. But everybody says, why didn't he just repair that at time of transplant? Well, but it, but it, but it. Now, right there, I'm mentioning that because uh, my, aortic, my aortic valve wasn't repaired at time of transplant, several doctors since then have questioned and said, why didn't he just repair the the, the donor heart then before he put it in? Fix the valve, then put it in. Then you wouldn't be dealing with this. Dr. Uh, Davies, you can't see it because it's not video it's just audio but dr davies face changes and he goes into defensive mode very kind man but in defensive mode on behalf of my transplant surgeon dr mcgiffin uh, explaining to me that dr mcgiffin made the perfect choice okay here it is it wouldn't have mattered no and, and the, the valve was working okay the at the time of transplant right. but it just decayed so, sooner than normal right. it's not he couldn't have done anything at the time either i mean should he have replaced it then you probably that if he'd have put a he could have put a mechanical right, but if he'd have put a tissue valve in there, I'd be, and, and be we're here right now with a tissue valve. Right. Yeah, and he kept you off coming in, and you never Absolutely. know how long they're gonna last. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, hold so on. We're talking about are we talking about mechanical? No, it's a tissue type valve. Okay. You just take aspirin and Plavix for about six months, then just aspirin. Gotcha. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. You're Thank you for rescuing my heart. Yes. Sir. All right, that beats the socks off of every other option. If I've got to have my aortic valve replaced, not having open heart surgery, being able to do a transcatheter, and now having everybody involved who was involved from the beginning, tremendous confidence in what's about to happen, okay? So let me encourage you that, you know, I had some dark days last week. Let me admit it. I had some times last week when, Oh, I just didn't want to face this. You know, my wife, uh, my my parents, my mother, I know particularly, um, cried their eyes out over this this last week because we just didn't want to go down this road again. But in the back of my mind, I knew that something had to be better than it sounded. And uh, to me, the best part is not that the procedure is now transcathed. That's great, obviously. But again, that I'm being cared for by the team I'm familiar with, by people who know me, by people who, you know, it's just a great feeling. So I promised you in the beginning of this that this would be a, a lengthy video. We've gone over 30 minutes right now, 35 minutes almost. So if you're here to the end, thank you so much for being here with me. That just continues to prove to me that you care about me, okay? And that, that humbles me to no end. You care about me. Yes, you come here for information, education, for all the things that I promise, but you also care about me and my story. Now, hopefully through hearing my story today, you've been inspired by that. Hopefully you have caught a few things and learned from them about this procedure. I plan to do videos soon on the actual 
this type of valve replacement as well as the aortic stenosis and explain those things out. But more than anything today, I hope you've just seen and heard that the the storyline and how it's gone and how things have just really, really just fallen into place. You know, this is a puzzle. This is something that we cannot typically understand. And even though we get down and out and frustrated and maybe you're in one of those positions wherever you are in your journey, pre or post, we, we don't see the way through these things sometimes. But once they work out and once you see what I call the hand of God in something, there's no denying that, okay? And, and for you to look back in hindsight and see the great things about your life, it's just wonderful. And so I'm inspired by so many of you. I hope that I've inspired some of you in some small way. And uh, wow, just thank you so much for your love and support. Thank you for being with me today on a part of this video. You mean a lot to me. And um, I'm just so happy to be a part of this Transplant Helper community and to be a part of it in such a way that you and I can share our stories one with another. So I would love to hear your stories. I mean, really. Uh, if, if you would like to sit down one day and, and interview and talk about your story, you could change the lives of hundreds of people, if not thousands, with your story. And I would be, I would really, really, really uh, enjoy being a part of that. So hit me up. You can find me on Facebook um, anyway under my name, Jim Merle, J-I-M-M-U-R-R-E-O-L, as well as on Twitter, transplant underscore help. Uh, you can email me at jim at thetransplanthelper.com. There's just a lot of ways um to get in touch with me, and I'd love to hear from you because I want to continue to share in this journey. I love each of you. Thank you so much. Until next time, you, my friend, stay stronger.